So okay. I'm going to hand it over to Dale. Exactly. Dale, Dale has all the questions, but you know what? I'm going to be part of this conversation too. So I think it's great that we're all on board. And those who are watching in a, uh, wherever you're watching from, thank you so much for tuning in. Tell your friends to tune in. They don't want to miss this opportunity. I'm going to start off uh, talking with, with Jason a little bit. And, uh, and Jacob, you can, you can um, please jump in at any time. Um, uh, Jason, are you in Peterborough still? Is that where you're living? Yeah, I'm uh, home in Peterborough. That's uh, home base now. Yeah, that's great. And and uh, so way way back when you, when you first got into to uh, the music scene, what was your life like? What, what were you doing in that time in your life when you first started doing the band thing? Well, I started Hawk Nelson. When I was 17, so <clears throat> I was actually still in high school. <clears throat> the rest of the band, I was the youngest in the band, so the other guys uh, they were out of school and they were all working jobs and trying to convince me to homeschool, finish on the road. Yeah. My, my parents uh, gave me the big no. <laughs> um, so I, I lived at my parents' house. I lived in my parents, uh, you know, I had, you know, 17 year old kid stuff, you know. And that so was, what uh, kind of experience did you have to draw from to write? Or did you do any writing? Yeah, I mean, honestly, a lot of the songs, I mean, I, I can say this, I all, make fun of myself all day <laughs> every song i wrote as a 17 year old was basically a blink 182 ripoff mm. and uh i mean i'm basically still doing that and you know i'm, I'm okay with that <laughs> no, no one has laid uh filed a lawsuit against me yet so yet. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that took you on the the beginning of the hawk nelson and that's way back how many years ago was that gosh that's uh that was 2003 2003 so, yeah. 17 years 17 years now yeah it's yeah. nuts it is it is and you've gone through a journey from that musical journey uh jacob what about you when you first started uh way back at the beginning whenever you maybe your first your first time you were playing in public or whatever that is yeah yeah i mean uh for me it was um i was uh i was just coming you know coming out of university basically finishing up at Laurier, which I just drove by the other day in Waterloo, and it's, it freaked me right out, gave me the, gave me the heebie-jeebies again, <laughs> driving by that school, because <laughs> it was a very intimidating place to, uh, to go to school. A lot of great musicians, people have been playing music since they were, you know, five or whatever, and I was pretty late to the game in a lot of ways, and so, um, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting time. Uh, that was when I was kind of writing songs of faith, writing songs about getting your heart broken, uh, you know, and both songs would appear on the same album. And that kind of began a trajectory of kind of me just kind of writing from that first person perspective of, of uh, kind of whatever I kind of felt called to write about. And, um, and yeah, it's, it, it kind of started, I guess, it right around the mid 90s. And uh, so it's been about 25 years for me of, of making yeah. music. Um, yeah, 11 albums and it's uh, it's a journey. It's I'm still learning a lot. Yeah. It's still a ton to learn about writing songs. Now, the very first time you were writing, what was your um, your motivation, your your artistic preference, your point of reference? Well, it's it was definitely like I wanted to be able to perform it as a solo acoustic guitarist. Mm -hmm. I figured if I could do that, then it was sustainable. That I could actually take it on the road, and it wouldn't be uh, it, if it would always existed in that form from the beginning, you know what I mean? Then I could always make it bigger with a band, but mm -hmm. it would always be, you know, uh, proportionally correct for the live shows that I was playing. Mm -hmm. And I'd be able to just carry those little song songs to people's uh, ears, you know, in, in, in a certain format that I could reproduce myself. And, uh, and, and, and thus began a business model of doing it as a solo artist, right. which I think is maybe, if anything, maybe the most uh, compelling reason for my longevity is just the fact that I've been able to, I haven't had to hand out, you know, per diems to the drummers, bassists, right, and yeah. some backup singers for 25 years. And so right. I you've, you've worked with bands though. You have worked with well, bands and I know you have yeah. with people you work with. But what, so it's very strategic. It sounds like you started off with the intention that you could hold your own and, yeah, and then you got into loops, and that was something that kind of changed your uh, presentation. Yeah, it just made it it made it uh, more compelling. Like I was still learning in the '90s, you know, how to play in front of audiences and how to just get through a song without screwing up. Mm -hmm. And and looping came along and kind of even just made it harder, actually, in some right. ways, because uh, my ambition was to realize all these other guitar parts, percussion parts, 
um, be able to play guitar solos live on my own with backing that I created in the moment. And uh, that was all a real big challenge. I thought it was going to be, you know, the silver bullet when I first got it. I thought, this is it. I'm, I'm going to get a live looping pedal. I'm going to go out there. Uh, and everyone's going to freak out, you know, at the old English parlor where I'm playing on Friday night, you know, from 10 till 2. And uh, no one noticed. I basically put <laughs> the dark in the corner, you know, while people watch the hockey game on a, on a TV above my head. Yeah, yeah. So, which was great, actually, because it gave me the cover to be able to just work on my craft and work on what I do and make all my mistakes in uh, obscurity, basically, and so that I could bring it, the off-Broadway show, to Broadway someday as a world, you know? <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, that gave me some good development years, you know, just just working on looping. But it's it's been something that I've kind of pioneered in some ways, and now I think there's lots of people who do it. Um, but it, I always say looping is just another pedal, right? It's just another yeah, like yeah, pedal or yeah, a yeah. first pedal. Like, what are you going to do with it, right? Yeah. That's always the question. It's a, uh, it's, it's a creative tool, but the creativity still has to come from, from the artist. Yeah, and, and, you, and you made an interesting observation about it kind of complicating your presentation because people don't realize for that one hour show, it takes months and months and months and hours upon hours of practice because yeah. you, don't, you don't, I mean, I've tried it with a loop pedal. It's incredibly difficult. Yeah. Um, if you, and it takes uh, like uh, discipline to, and, and I can only tip, tip my hat off to you for what, for what you're able to accomplish in a live presentation. Um, so let's get back to songwriting. Um, if we could talk, Jason, um, uh, you um, um, work at a church currently, is that correct? That is correct. I am the uh, worship director at Pathway Church here in Peterborough. And uh, I've been doing that for, I guess, as a job for a year. But I've been volunteering there for, since I moved home, this will be my fourth year home this summer. So. And, and, and the pastoral staff, uh, namely your, your pastor, who became your boss, hired you on and said, look, we need you full time. We, we, your contribution is uh, just to what we need right now. And you're like, oh, great, I'm in. Pretty much, yeah. Well, it's funny because, uh, Dale, as we were kind of talking earlier, you were trying to get a straight answer out of us in an interview many years ago, and you had a hard time getting an answer out of us, and that's mostly myself to blame. Um, I've improved a lot over the years, but uh, the problem with me is, uh, I don't know, it's just, I don't even know if it's a creative thing, or just maybe I'm just a terrible person, but <laughs> my, uh, my tongue works faster than my brain. Yeah, and, uh, no, I, I, I'm in that boat. Song, right? To I'm there that. too, bro. I'm there too. So uh, I remember um, one morning or one night, my wife is a music teacher as well. She teaches from home here. And uh, he, she t teaches uh, a couple of his kids. And there was a knock on our door late one night. And I answered the door and it was our pastor. He's like, hey, man, can I come in for a second? And I was like, the first thing in my, th in my head, I was like, I must have, what did I say at church yesterday? I'm like, I said something on stage and I offended someone and he's coming to talk to me about it. I'm like, uh oh. Oh, no. But, uh, he actually funny. came in and offered me a job right then and there. So that was awesome. Cool. Yeah. So you're like, oh no, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Man. Great oh thing. man, what did I say? But that's funny. Yeah, I can't imagine what was going through your head at the time. Yeah. That'd be kind of weird. Okay, so that that that's where you're at today. So let's talk about um, writing for you. Do you do you still write? Do you, are you at that point where you like to write songs? I do. Yeah, I still I still try to make it a practice to do at least. Um, at least one idea every day. Um, I, I, I'm really curious to hear Jacob's uh, strategy because yeah, we're I, going I'm to really fascinating how everyone does it, and I know yeah. everyone does it different. And I, for sure, can guarantee that my way is not the right way. <laughs> there's there's me, no I wrong just, way. There's no wrong way to write because yeah, well, I don't know about that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I try to put down at least one idea. It's mostly just if it's just a melody or a lyric, right. just two seconds worth just so at least it keeps me going in the right direction so do you have someone in particular you like to collab with is there anybody you like to sit down with and say man i really appreciate your input um recently you not really. with me <laughs> <laughs> everybody wants to hang out with you <laughs> no as a as a kid definitely like um i had a lot of influences growing up uh trevor mcneven um, from thousand foot crutch yeah you know, we grew up together and uh, I still look at him like a big brother. And yeah. uh, he really, really took me under his wing uh, growing up. Um, you know, he signed to my favorite record label as the kid, which is Tooth yeah. and L Records. You know, yeah, MXTX is on that label. And they signed to that label. And 
I was like, can you take them our demo? And, uh, you know, from there it stemmed to yeah. uh, the president of Tooth and Nail, Brandon Evil, asked Trevor to, to write with us as a band for the first couple right. just to kind of get our feet wet. And uh, absolutely, that was the greatest uh, thing that I could have ever learned from, it, learning from him how to write songs. And yeah, do you, would, you, would you consider Trevor a bit of a mentor um, when you oh, were starting? Not even a bit, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So there, the, I was like, the reason why I'm s sitting there for a minute is because I think people out there need to hear that having mentorship or having somebody to help them to develop who they are is vitally important. Um, and and any, anybody who's um, in the music industry today has had somebody who they've been looking up to in a musical sense and saying, Oh, if only I could, let me break down how they write. Let me, let me look at what they do and see if I can do something similar and make that be like a, a, a way to view my own, because I want to be like that. So, you know, that's probably yeah. the journey you took as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, just the, the mindset I always try to take, even today, is just like, there's always a better idea and someone always has a better idea than yes. me. Yes. And uh, I, like I said, I'm really excited to hear Jacob's uh, story and hear his approach because I know without a doubt I'm going to take something out of it tonight and uh, good. hopefully become a better songwriter because of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's go over to Jacob and, and we'll start talking about method methodology now. Uh, mm -hmm. So, Jacob, well, let's look at, uh, I know that you probably um, come at a song from different ways, but let's look at your, your, your most important, your most, like, what way do you address um, tackling a song? Do you think of a theme? Do you get a hook? Do you get a line? Do you get a music note? Like, how does it unfold? Yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's really important for me anyways, that it, that the process begin in the most um, intuitive, um, almost naive uh, beginnings that I possibly can, 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 can muster. If I can actually create a scenario where I'm not really driving the process with my mind, but I'm mm -hmm. driving it with, um, something that I already know that is waiting to come out, whether it's something that my hands already know on the guitar and they just kind of go to naturally, mm -hmm. um, or it's something that my voice wants to, to sing, um, unfettered by any harmony of, of any kind. Um, maybe just root notes, you know? I like the idea, um, and I've done it on a few occasions, of writing with a bass guitar in my hands, as opposed to a, a guitar or a piano, because uh, the guitar or the piano sometimes has a way of bossing your melody around. Yeah, they kind of fill the fill more than what a bass may have just the background kind of, and you kind of yeah. What it is is that able to play around the, it. The, the chords that you would might reach for on the mm -hmm. acoustic guitar or the piano, um, they kind of they kind of create this little fence. Mm. This little harmonic fence of three notes, you know, in the triad or more. Yeah. yeah. And um, they they kind of say, okay, here's your here's some notes that that are consonant, and you better kind of sing something that falls in that little in that in that uh, in, within those construct constructs. And and if you can actually take that away and say, no, just one note, the bass note, sing something that works above that. It could be the major third. It could be the minor third. It could be a suspended note. Right. It could be a note that, you know, is just a little outside, you know what I mean? Um, and maybe it's leading to the next uh, note in the chord and the chord sequence. And, and those things can be invaluable when you're, when you're starting out and you just, you don't know what the song's about. It's like you're a sculptor and yeah. you got a big block of marble in front of you and you just start chipping away at it. Yeah. You're like, what does this thing want to be? I don't know yet. I mean, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of sculptors, when you talk to them, they don't set out to create at somebody's head or a squirrel or whatever. They kind of, they just start chopping and then they, the block of whatever it is reveals itself mm -hmm. and they start to discover what it was supposed to be all along. And that's yeah. kind of, that's, it's a mystical experience writing a song because you don't really, unless you're going in going, okay, I have to write a song for this event and it's got to contain these buzzwords or whatever it is. Maybe you're writing to some kind of a brief or you're writing, there used to be this thing called taxi, right? Mm -hmm. Remember taxi? And does it still happen? Where no. they kind of put out, no? Okay, <laughs> so there's a thing in LA, they would put out these briefs about, okay, this TV show needs a song that's at this BPM uh, about this topic. It's gotta be sung by a little male vocal and it's gotta right. have these instruments in it. And if you could actually pull that off and on time deliver the song, you might have a shot at being yeah. in the running for being selected. And uh, that's a different kind of songwriting. And I think the kind that I 
tend to do. But I always like the idea of, of throwing out the handbook too, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, Brian Eno, he always worked with like people like you too, right? Um, Paul Simon, and he carries around this little book, you know, and it's a book of, and you can get it, I think on Amazon or whatever. Um, or you used to be able to without <laughs> before the pandemic, but uh, there was a book of, of like, uh, there's like ideas in it and it would say just like, um, start with the middle or flip everything around backwards or whatever, every page would have a different instruction. And if you kind of just picked a random page and put your finger on it, that would be your directive for the moment. If you were stuck, if you had total writer's block, you're yeah. like, I don't know what to do next. You could maybe use this book to trick yourself out of it. Um, and I like techniques like that. Sometimes if you're really blocked up and nothing's coming out. Mm. Uh, that's, that's a good comment too. Like, I think a lot of people, um, maybe they're writing and they get to the point, where, I don't know how to write and the song's not, it's not finished or I'll put it in the back burner or come back to it later. And, and you'll have an opportunity then to just maybe re-explore you, how, how you're writing like your methodology I, but for you when you sit down with the guitar is that probably the principal way that you start with the guitar strum? yeah, yeah that, for sure that's your strongest yeah. instrument but i'm just thinking that might be something you were to start yeah. to sing, sing along with right? i know at some point i'm going to have to deliver it on that instrument so i think yeah. i tend to yeah. start there i think if i didn't have that if i was if i was the kind of artist that just had to produce music that would be played somewhere um, my process would be very different. I might operate inside the box a little more, like in the mm -hmm. Pro Tools environment or whatever, and just start calling up beats and, right. and uh, working with virtual instruments and, and composing songs that way. I actually still have an idea for my next project that involves that process. Oh, good. Which is kind of fun. Yeah, just a, an idea of kind of almost, um, you know, like think of people like Todd Rundgren or Rufus Wainwright or people who kind of compose everything. Mm. You know, every note is kind of written by them, you know, yeah. and, and think, of, I think of like coming up with uh, just a, an opus, a, 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 I mean, a song cycle of, of stuff that I've kind of put together and composed. Because I think that's, as, I, as I've gone along, I've realized I've had some strengths as a writer and one is an arrangement. Mm -hmm. And I like arranging other people's songs. Yeah, and arrangements, can, as you know, arrangements can make or break a song. Um, yeah, and, and, and it, that's, that's a real good tool set to have. Well, especially if you're, we were talking about being stuck, right? No, so you're well, stuck, you yeah, we're talking about arrangements. Yeah, yeah, right. You got, you got, like, you got, you got a course, and I was like, where do we go for the right. bridge? Right. You know, or the pre and if you have some knowledge of arrangement yeah. theory, then you have somewhere that you can go with that. You say, okay, the song's in G. We've used up the chords G, C, D, and E minor. Mm -hmm. Now what? You know, what go I mean? major or minor. And no one would think it up. Yeah, you want to mix it up and you think, well, what can I go for the bridge? Well, if you know some yeah. theory, you know, you can go to like, you know, you can go to the B flat, right, you know, right, and right. it's change yeah, exactly. it up. Exactly. Borrow a chord from, from or you uh, go back you know. to the bass note. <laughs> yeah, you can go to the bass note, yeah. but, but you can change it all. And, and that, I think that for some people, they may not know how to do uh, maybe a modulation or something to get the song a different uh, layer. And then, yeah. and then be able to go, maybe and that might help them change the perspective of where the song sits you know, and then they can take it to another direction. But yeah, you're so, right. Like Bob Dylan used to do a thing where he, and it, lyrically he would do a thing where he'd write uh, like 18 verses for a song, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. And on some of his longer songs, he'd actually use a lot of those verses. <laughs> but he would, uh, but uh, he would actually, he would try to pick the best ones, right? Yeah. And so I think, writing, right? Well, when it comes to writing, that you, the more you do it, the better you get. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like anything you do. The more you practice, the better you get at it. And uh, yeah, you can, you can even test that yourself when you're, when you're, you're looking at stuff you wrote 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, uh, so, so Jason, let's talk a bit about your songwriting. Um, uh, what kind of method would, uh, would you use when you're sitting down to write a song? Um, well, for me, it's a little bit different. I, uh, I've never been like classically trained or anything like that. You know, I learned to play the guitar from my dad when I was 10. Um, so my first song I ever wrote, I think was one chord. And, but I've never actually gone far off from that. I try to keep my chord progression super simple. When I'm, especially when it comes to writing melodies, I'll use maybe a maximum of four chords. And then once the melody's written, or I got the melody kind of where I can't get it out of my head, then I'll kind of take a look at the progression and see what could be made better or made different. 
um, I, I really found working with different record producers really uh, inspired me and just kind of changed my way of thinking. Our first two albums with Hawk was with uh, producer Aaron Sprinkle. And um, just hearing his creative take on it was just amazing, you know, because he'd obviously been doing it a lot longer. And um, to hear his ideas and approach was like, whoa, I would have never thought of that. And so uh, I always kind of still go back to whenever I'm recording a song or writing a song, I'm like, what would Aaron Sprinkle do in this situation? You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I've, I've, that's never changed for me. And um, yeah, I, I try to just, you know, I, this little saying I have in one of my notebooks is just keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, the old kiss method. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we used to call I do it kiss find, method. I do find your approach is very interesting. Um, in a sense, you both start from a different base. Um, Jason, you just finished saying that you only do maximum four chords. Jacob, I was kind of intrigued with your method, which is starting with the base, um, starting with almost starting at the foundation before actually building a song, which I think is really awesome. Um, because I think most successful songs do build, they build from a foundation and then I guess grow or, or expand from there. Um, do you find that? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I, I'm very, um, I'm very impatient to get to the guitar part of the song. Right? Of course. <laughs> figure out what it is that I'm going to be playing. Like, what's what's the guitar going to say in the song? Yeah. And sometimes I will actually write the whole guitar part entirely. Or, or sometimes, actually, I've had a situation where I had the guitar part in my head, but I, my hands didn't know how to play it yet. So I had to actually write it out in tablature and read it and learn how to and lift my own ideas out of my brain off the page because it was complicated enough that my hands were just jokers that didn't know how to play it yet right and i can so, relate uh, to that yeah I, yeah I, and I, maybe maybe, 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 maybe we can all relate to that with my mouth as yeah. well jason say that again i said i have many like jago i have many uh, guitar solos i've just done with my mouth into a voice recorder because i know my hands can't do it same yeah 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 <laughs> No, it's real because it's, it's you have a we have a um, different instruments have different uh, musical intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. So our voice has a lot of musical intelligence sure. and emotional intelligence, and sometimes the guitar or hands have to be taught that or coached through that, and that's yeah. that's been my experience. Anyways. Yeah, you're you're leading me into a different a thought pattern here, which is great. Uh, different songs, like for instance, it, I would write differently on a keyboard than I would on a guitar or an electric guitar. The mm. song takes on a different approach. Um, and so if you have a song that's floating around in your mind and you've, you're envisioning it with certain instruments, uh, it really um, persuades the type of song as far as musically, how it progresses. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, uh, my songs tend to be guitar driven um, but I'm always thinking about ways in which um, that can not get so samey by the adding mm -hmm. up instruments or by having different kinds of guitars or, or have no guitars or, you know, just the sections where the guitar isn't really the big feature. But I confess that I still want to hear something happening on the guitar. Like when I hear a band um, and I think to myself, that is a band that I wouldn't want to be the guitar player in. You know, <laughs> because there's not much guitar playing. Yeah, I was going, like I used to think that about Coldplay. You know, I think my, I've changed a little bit in my assessment of that band, but but I think when they first started, it was a very much a, a very it's a keyboard like, forward band, yeah, of course, very much. And if the guitar was playing anything, he was playing like basically eighth notes on the totally. same note. I think yeah, I think of that song yeah. "Yellow," it was just like, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. I was like no, no, no. But still, but still, Coldplay yeah. was doing so well in the charts. They did, yeah, yeah, they had a niche and they did really, and that just goes to show you everybody different styles for different people and. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with actually being a, as a guitarist, you're listening to the other instruments as well. Uh, what you said, you touched on earlier about when not to play. Yeah. And I think that's probably a technique which people who are more mature in their music, musicality understand better about when not to play. True, true, exactly. That's a very good point. I mean, I've worked with worship teams in churches where it's just everybody's playing and singing every bar of every song yeah you know? I mean, no one can fathom a world in which somebody stopped playing <laughs> <You know what laughs> <I mean? laughs> and that's and i think that whatever that's sometimes if i get an opportunity to kind of coach worship teams and stuff like that that's what it has to do with it's just hey you know, like let's build this thing and that's the same thing if i'm recording my own song and producing my own song 
how can we uh, take people on a journey, you know, through what we don't play sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's the dynamic aspect of writing a song. Yeah. Um, Jason, whenever you're um, like currently now working with the church and you're working with, do you ever come to the point where you say, I've got a new song I'd like to introduce? And uh, how, does, how does that, like, how do you introduce a new song that you're writing? Is it progressive things sometimes? Or is For it, me, it's, it's, uh, I, it? I, I have a playlist full of like working demos mm -hmm. and uh, I have this weird, and Jacob, you might be able to relate to this. Maybe not actually, you're, you seem a far more, uh, better, better than me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do it delicately. Uh, He's just got a bigger brain. Don't worry about no, it. No, it's yeah. just, you're smart and I'm just, you know, simple. No. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Hot Yeah. And if I, if I like produce it myself, I'm always like, this could sound better in somebody else's hands. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm like, so I'm like, I don't want to put this out because someone's like, oh man, you should have done this. And I'm like, and then there's even Hawk songs that I listen to. I'm like, that's not right. We shouldn't mm -hmm. have done that. We would mm -hmm. do a B flat where we should have stayed on a G or you know what right. I mean? Just like, why, why? And so I don't listen to any of my own stuff once it's released because it's one of those weird mess up things that my brain has to deal with. But Because you're saying to yourself, I can't do anything about it anyway. So why should I bother? Yeah. <laughs> but so I wanted just to go back to what you guys were saying a little earlier about how if you write a song on an acoustic guitar is different when you write it on an electric yeah. guitar or write it on a piano or bass, whatever. One other thing I wanted to just throw out there is also playing it in a different key makes a huge difference to me. Mm -hmm. yep. like, uh, if I wrote a song in G, if I play it up in A, suddenly the song, it's just, it's an added energy or, or less. And it's just like, whoa. And suddenly you see it through a different lens. So I just yeah, wanted to throw that out there as well, something to try. Oh, that's, that's a huge true. thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I relate to that in a huge way. It's, uh, I, I'm always playing with keys. And, and, but again, it, it's um, sometimes your facility on the instrument or your familiarity with things like capos or whatever yeah, yeah. can sometimes box you in. Like I've, I've read often that U2 is a band that, you know, have, <laughs> have had to over the years learn how to play things in different keys. But they labored for whatever, 10 years without really knowing how to do that. They didn't know enough about the music or changing the music to, uh, to do that. And Bono over the years said had to lower the, the keys of the songs because he can't sing that high. Right, anymore. right. His range is lost. Learn some things about theory along the way, but we can all yeah. learn some things about theory that would help us to find the most, the key that as, as, uh, as he was saying there, uh, the, um, the, the, what's the key that will make your voice sound the sweetest in? Yeah, where you, what's your comfort zone? And you're looking that, at, yeah, like yeah. where you're still sounding urgent and and uh, strident as a singer, but where it's not reaching to the point where it's a real sounds like a strain. Right. Know? So the need to know uh, from an artist's point of view what that is. Uh, so that that might be a, a challenge for some to people to find. Oh, where is my range? Uh, what where's my comfort zone in my singing uh, or yeah. or performing? Whatever the case may be. Yeah. 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 But if writing for a different situation, for example, for a church song, like Jason, you probably can relate to this, um, thinking of the key, you almost have to think, I've been told anyway, that you have to think about what- The audience, you right, you're, you're exactly, your corporate. Yeah, so so yeah. how do you get that balance? Like yeah. your voice range plus what the people can sing, is there like a magic chord? Well, yeah, I, I don't know. What do you think, Jason? I, I, I agree, like there are, you know, our church has, you know, a few hundred people in it. So like, you're not going to try to like, oh, this guy over there, he's a baritone. So I should probably sing in his key. I do think you got to stay true to whoever's leading. If, if someone's leading and you're picking, hey, you got to sing this key and B, they're like, and it sounds like garbage. You don't want that because it's just going to, it's going to be a distraction. So you find the key that suits the, the leading, whoever's mm -hmm. leading. At least for me, anyways. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. And, it's, and again, you don't have a, to drop the octave. No one cares. Or put a little kind of harm up there, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. but also, you have to realize, I guess, from a performance, performance point of view, are you uh, doing it as a singer, songwriter, or are you doing it as a corporate worship? And that will change a lot to do with the key that you sing it in. Because, like, it's, like we touched on earlier, the comfort zone for you as a vocalist, where that feels best. Now, I, um, we are coming to the end of our time together, and um, I, I wanted to make sure that you guys had a chance to say um, something maybe we weren't, was not touched on. 
um, something that you thought, oh man, I'd love to be able to say this. This is a great platform for me to do this. So maybe we'll start off with, with, with uh, Jason, since you're there now, just talk to us about um, what, what would you like someone to, to, that you wanted to get on here to say this? And what is it you wanted to say? Uh, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. This is really a, it was an honor to be here and hang out. And hopefully whoever's watching learned something or took something out of this. Totally. Um, I guess if anything, parting words or whatever would be, make sure you enjoy it. Like have fun with what you do. Like it's, it is, it's, it's an art, but it's a craft mm -hmm. and enjoy yourself and have a good time with it and play around Absolutely. it. Make some memories and uh, it doesn't matter if the song is gold to somebody else. If it's gold to you, that's important. Yeah, right. And uh, I, I think uh, I feel very fortunate and very blessed that a few of my songs did get used in some things. And I'm super grateful for that. And I don't ever expect that to happen again. But if it doesn't happen again, that doesn't mean I'm not going to stop writing songs. No. You know what I mean? and, and joy is contagious. So that's, that's important yeah. to convey that. How about you, Jason? Uh, Jacob, anything that uh, you wanted to say? Yeah, I want to thank you guys again for, for having this forum, and I think it's important, and, and I think uh, uh, songwriters need to hear that, that uh, every, all of us, you know, struggle as well with songwriting, and that it's not an easy thing for us, mm. um, uh, even, even if you've been doing it for a lot of years, sometimes you sort of come up against the idea that that blank page is, is going to kind of stare at you for a lot longer, and, and maybe you've written your last song, you know what I mean? But I want to encourage people to use whatever you can as far as tools go to, um, to have, uh, have courage to, 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 to forge into the unknown, whether it's through collaborating with, with uh, another songwriter, uh, sitting in a room with somebody, or even just sharing files back and forth. Um, you can sometimes get out of your own head, out of your mm -hmm. own- Yes, um, your uh, own space, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. your own routines and, yeah. and little things that you do <laughs> and sounds that you make and borrow somebody else's energy for a minute and, uh, and work with that. And sometimes just by having the objectivity of hearing their song and being going, I can see what this song needs to, to have to fix it. You know, right. sometimes you don't even have that about your own song. Like you <laughs> have it about, as we all do, right? We can all see what's wrong with everybody else. Right. No, we have these blind spots. We can't see what's wrong with ourselves. And so same thing, same thing sometimes is true with songs. So when you play our songs for our friends, for our musical friends, um, I really think that's an important way to get that first response of, does this lyric make sense? Yeah. You know? that's, that, yeah. That's something like it's the wrong the length or what? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I so think that's we great. do have, we do have actually some extra time that's been given to us, thankfully. So we don't have to rush off, but if there's any, um, uh, well, besides wonderful tips, um, I guess some other thoughts. Did you have other questions, Dale, that you would have wanted to cover? Well, uh, yeah, um, there, one thing in particular, um, whenever um, it comes to working with a band, uh, you both have experience with this. Um, what kind of, um, if you were to give somebody a, a tool that they say this, if you're working with other people, this is the one thing you need to really take advantage of or, or you need to be aware of. Besides personalities, I mean, just talking about musicality. A click track. <laughs> that's <what we> <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's it. That's I, it. I that's <laughs> the minute you play a song too fast or too slow, it's wrecks it. And uh, <laughs> I'm borderline perfectionist when it comes to that kind of stuff. And um, I've that was something an old music teacher of mine taught me when I was 16. And uh, so every band I've played, and we've played with click track since we were 16 years old. And that's something I brought in. Uh, when I started at the church and a lot of the band guys hated it and now they love it and you can see a huge improvement and especially when it comes to songwriting like that's finding that right tempo is it's it's important. Dale did you just hang up on us? Nope um he's still uh, here. Dale, I don't know. Does not like a click track. Right there yeah <laughs> It looks like we have a question from uh, some of our listeners here. One asked, um, have you ever written from energy? Have any of you ever written based on, I guess, energy? I guess how you feel? Like oil and gas, uh, solar, that kind of thing. What are we talking about? Talking about just like uh, energy, like as in like 
different parts of the chakras? What are we talking about here? We, we didn't hear um, hasn't given clarity, but I'm guessing, I guess, um, if I can take a, take a stab at this, I'm wondering if he's asking if you've ever written based on um, if you feel happy and energetic and you end up writing a song a certain way as opposed to when you're feeling down and out, do you write a certain way? Like, has, your, has the time that you've written your music most been based on your, can I say emotions, I guess, or? Yeah. No? No, I don't think so. I mean, it takes me so long sometimes to write a song. And I go through all the emotional states by the time I'm done. Yeah. Because what's the lyric about? You know what I mean? And the lyric might be the thing that you know started in a certain emotional state. Um, and so, uh, so that that's that's possible. Every song has a mood. Every song has an energy to it. That's yeah. Song. But as far as like deciding before I write it that it's I'm going to write a fun song today, like that's a great way to not get a song written. You know. Right. It's, or not a very good one song. Good song written because you just you're 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 prescribing. You know. The, the creative process as opposed to following it. Yeah, one of the things we talked about um, in our previous sessions, we talked about the theme and the focus of the song and trying to stay on, on that focus for, so I call it the, the ring, the Lord of the Rings. You always have that, the ring has to be part of the song if it's, if it's about that subject. You don't want to wait too far away from that subject because mm -hmm. you might cause confusion, but there's a creative way to deal with that topic maybe that will bring it on a, on a perimeter concept into the actual theme. So there's so many different techniques. Uh, um, what's imagery or what type of um, like story writing? Do you use story writing in your songs? Do you use that type of concept? Um, and, or do you use more like, what would be, uh, what, what, what could I hear myself coming from my own place? Or, would it, or can I, see myself in somebody else's place. Like, how do you approach a song writing? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's usually first person, but I mean, I, I try to think of, there has been a couple of occasions where it's been somebody else's story and I've just yeah. been kind of narrating it through song. Um, uh, but I think you, know, you sort of write what you know and, and sometimes mm. you write what you've heard and sometimes you write what you've read. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I think the best songs come when you write what you feel, you know? Yeah, yeah. And when the, you can kind of hear somebody's feeling song that's what gives you goosebumps you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like don't tell me what you know tell me what you're feeling that's, right. that's yeah. yeah um for me i i always lyrics always come last for me i'd say 99 percent of the time mm -hmm. and uh i will just hum or sing just ramble words and whatever in the melody there'll be certain words that'll just pop and whatever the word may be and and i'll just run off of those if it's two or three words I'll just use those and like that's kind of the hook of the song and then it kind of build it off that and that can usually lead to most times it leads to something half decent sometimes yeah. it doesn't mm -hmm. yeah Cheryl and I talked about that earlier today we talked about um, um, when you use a, a music with a lyric that you take the lyric and you change the lyric the melody perhaps over the same music and then take the music that's you know you can take a song and change how the melody lies over top of the of the chord progression to change the songs uh, to make it more creative um, from verse to chorus. Like some songs have the exact same melody line in chorus and verse, but they change the way it's sung and it takes it to a whole new level. So writing songs like that can be um, a good tool in your tool belt to, to write some songs. I, uh, yeah, and another thing I was thinking of is, uh, and I'm just, I'm very guilty of this, is I tend to overthink everything and then you look at a song like Mr. Brightside by The Killers. It's just one verse and one chorus. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's an unbelievable song, right? And it's just, they didn't put much thought into it. It's, well, maybe they put a lot of thought into that verse, but <laughs> it's, it doesn't, there's not much thought into it, like just one verse. I'm mm -hmm. always like, oh, I need a second, maybe a third verse. And I have to stop overthinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes some songs, simple is better, but uh, yeah. Uh, we have another question that's come up. Um, there's a question from someone wanting to know if you have any tips on completing songs. Now, how do you know when a song's finished? That, that's a question that I, I've been posed before. How do you know when a song's complete? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, for me, that's, uh, that's, that's, it's a, it's, a, it's a feeling you have when you're listening back to it over and over again. You, you, have to step out of it as the composer and step into it as the listener. 
and you've got to you got to get to a place where um, you're hearing the song objectively, and sometimes that's through another person's ears. You're putting it on for them and saying, "Listen, what do you think when you hear this song? Um, uh, where does it leave you? And does it leave you wanting more, or does it leave you feeling like you've been wrung out? You know." Um, and uh, is, do I have, is there more than I need to say? Is repeating the same chorus appropriate or do I need, kind of need a few new words in the chorus to make it sound unique? My thing is always like, do, will the song reward repeated listenings? You know, will this, will this be a thing that we will want to hear again? Or will we hear it once and go, I heard it. That's it. It all went in and that's, that's all, all, the, all the good I can glean from the song has been gleaned in that one listen. Um, and my thing is uh, trying to create music that's a little more timeless, that will last for decades and people mm. will come back to again and again um, for, uh, for comfort, you know, for, uh, uh, to, to be nourished in some way by it, you know? And, and so that's, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my test of a song is it has it got enough of those elements in it and as it uh, has it said all that it needs to say without turning into an opus of you know eight eight minute long you know ridiculousness. But I'm I'm not constrained by the same three minute timelines that I might be if I was writing for radio. Right, so, yeah. and that's important to note. Know your audience. Know know what your plans is for the song and the demograph. And if it's going to be a radio song, three twenty is the highest timeline. I get that. But there's there's laws. Uh, those laws are broken, um, especially in live. You can just go for days on the song sometimes. But yeah, it's, it's great to look at those uh, components. And also when you talked about um, taking a song and making it personal coming from yourself, when you're writing a song that comes from here, like from the, it, 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 uh, it's almost like there's an emotional aspect to it that other people maybe even resonate with. And that makes a song, uh, gives a song a hook, I guess, to other people. But talking about hooks, hooks are, there's different types of hooks. Maybe we could unpack um, maybe different kinds of hooks that, that you've been able to utilize in songs you've, you've been a part of and doing. You know, like there's vocal hooks, there's musical hooks, there's pre-chorus hooks, there's intros. Uh, mm, Jason, yeah. Yeah, um, for me, just, you know, with my background being more like punk rock, um, I find most of, or I create most of my hooks in more of the, like the background uh, vocals. Oh, uh, yeah. To me, that's, that's kind of like the icing on the cake for me, like whatever song, like, and kind of hits on the last, what we were just talking about with like, make sure that song has life to it. So you like, you want to listen to it again. So you don't want to just copy and paste that chorus in three times. So you're like, okay, double chorus at the end, just Apple C, Apple V that in there at the end. Yeah. It's just like, okay, there, the song's done. You're going to want to spice it up at the very end. At least that's my, uh, my go-to always mm -hmm. alter that final chorus melody, you know, hit that, uh, hit that top note that you wouldn't normally want to hit and right. uh, hope you never have to play it live. And you want to build. <laughs> you know? That's funny. Can I pull it off live? Yeah. Well, that's probably a criteria you're thinking to yourself too, depending on what you want to do with the song. Can I do this live? And uh, Jason, uh, Jacob, sorry, Jacob was talking about that earlier when he does a song. He always thinks about the performance side of it. Uh, yeah. So what about hook for you, uh, J uh, Jason, uh, for Jacob? Sorry, Jacob, what kind of a, yeah what's important uh, to you for hooks it, yeah it, it has to do with um the way that the uh the vowel sounds of the of the words and the, and the notes mm. come together um it's, it's sort of um it's got to have us uh, it's, it's, it's got to sing you know what i mean there's there's a lot of i can think of a lot of great songwriters that i love dearly that have written songs that have a lot to say but they don't the song the melodies don't sing that well you know what i mean mm. so they they, they just they have a different role maybe in that sense, maybe the more educational songs. I think of like songs about like Bruce Coburn or Joni Mitchell or Paul Simon, artists that I love, but sometimes they have these songs that have like, the, you know, it's almost like prose that they're trying to fit into a song structure. And it's a, it's a, it's two formats kind of clashing, you know what I mean? Almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, punk rock is really good for its economy. And, and Hawk Nelson was, you know, a great band for that. And, and Jason knows a lot about this, about, uh, you know, the economy of let's get to that melody. Let's, let's stick it with conviction. You know, let's not kind of caress it, but let's just like hit it with energy and power and, mm -hmm. and knock it out. And there, there's a lot that can be learned from that kind of uh, 
that kind of prototypical songwriting yeah. for, for all of us as songwriters. And some of us can really benefit from really um, nailing down our, our melodies to something that we can repeat again and again. Sometimes songwriters, they're so um, idiosyncratic and they, they sing in such a way that uh, it's almost, they're almost kind of improvising it every time. And it's giving the listener some familiarity to come back to um, and something to hang on to, you know, some repetition uh, mm -hmm. is, is, I think, a, a key way to hook in a listener for sure. Mm -hmm. And so um, we can't be afraid to use those those techniques, you know, whatever style we have. You know, it's, I think it's, it's important. Yeah. I have another question. But Cheryl, do you have anybody who's asked a question online? Yes, I do. I have a question about the writing for musicals. Um, one, I guess, if you have written for musicals, do you follow any particular styles or guidelines related to that? Or do you have any styles or guidelines related to that? Yeah, I got, I got nothing. Uh, you got nothing. <laughs> just watch Frozen and then just... <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Uh, any, no, I, <laughs> any Disney movie, they've got the most unbelievable hooks in their songs. Any of those songs, or any of those movies, it's unbelievable. So I've always, often joked, especially my last year with Hawk Nelson, I was like, I'm just gonna write the last album just by singing like Disney. And then you, if you just, if you put on that fake Disney voice, the Aladdin voice, and suddenly you just can write on these unbelievable melodies. It's, it's crazy, try it yourself. <laughs> That's cool, there you go. Some advice there. I, I've been in musical theater for years and whenever we do the songs that we do, um, they're not well sung necessarily. They're just well presented. They have the pageantry, the lights and the costumes and, and, and the, the acting is probably more important than the singing itself. But um, yeah, so doing a musical, it's, it's really, I think is conveying the message. If I was to say anything about that, you make sure your message is foremost. Um, and the singing is on pitch, please and thank you. But there's, the, there's um, yeah, so I don't know if uh, writing for musicals, I think that you have to respect the orchestration and, and the acting and make sure that it's, it's a part of the scene and not just a song for a song's sake. Uh, that's probably the only thing I could suggest. Um, I hope that helps you guys. Um, There's uh, still more questions. But let's keep it going. We got some people asking questions. Okay, so another question is, I think you probably answered this, but we, were, we, we had some trouble getting online. So uh, if you can repeat, do you write better starting with lyrics or with music? Okay. So what's your, what's your fundamental starting point? Uh, on a, I mean, that may change from time to time, but from, from a writing standpoint, you, you sit down with the guitar or do you, well, I know that Jason talked about the melody musically first and then the lyrics come later for him. Yeah, same thing for me. Yeah, it's, it's always music first. Um, it's almost never lyrics first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, gotta, it's gotta be something I wanna sing before I wanna say anything. Yeah. <laughs> I have a dog as well. What's your cat's name? Yeah. <laughs> My cat barks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, are you a dog person, Jason, or a cat person? I know, I, I know Jacob's a dog I, person. I, I'm, I have kids and that's, that's plenty. <laughs> that's all the animals you can take right now. I do have a dog. I, uh, oh, I, you do. I gave him to my, to my aunt for permanent adoption. Oh. <laughs> I not know that yet. You should see Jacob's dog. It's beautiful. I can relate, Jason. Trust me, I can relate. <laughs> I have another question here. Um, where do you go for help? This is again from our audience. Where do you go for help is the question. Mm. I have uh, actually three bookmarks on my, on my computer here. It's rhymezone.com, dictionary.com, and thesaurus.com. That's where I always go. Wow. <laughs> So that's, that's if you get to the place where you're looking for a word that would rhyme with the rhyming scheme. And that's important to get a thesaurus to find a different word to oh, say. Dude, I don't know if I can use that. Uh, all right. <laughs> that's good. That's good. How about you? Well, so being, that being said, I'm just going to ask this quick question. What um, is your thought about using larger word, words in songs? If it sings good, use it. <laughs> And that's the thing is it works when the times timing of the of the of the, the uh, melody then why not yeah and sometimes a bigger word it just happens to rhyme with the word that you uh have, have before it and uh it, you're, you're tired <laughs> you just throw it in there and you're like yeah good i can't be bothered writing yeah. something that means something i'm gonna go throw a big five syllable word yeah. in there. 
<laughs> you gotta you gotta check your head. You gotta check and next next morning. You gotta you gotta make sure that you didn't just do a bad thing. But but it um, yeah, I think I think uh, checking rhyme zone is gr is a great way to explore mm. your options and for near rhymes and you know phrase rhymes and all that stuff. You know what I mean? So it's because yeah, because people still love the rhymes. You know, after all the what stuff. About, what about friends? friends? Do you have friends that you go to and say, "Guy, I'm writing this song and I just can't pull this out of the woods." Is there anything like that? You know, I, I don't, I don't do that just because I don't, um, you don't work well with others. I know I get it. Misanthropic. No, I, I really just don't, I, I think you have to trust your own instincts. Yeah. I really believe in that. I think you have to, you have to, artists know when the song's done. They know when mm -hmm. the song, like you, you kind of keep your own counsel at that point, unless you're really learning and you're just beginning. Yeah, but if yeah. you've learned from the greats and you've sung songs live and you've seen what they do and whether it's going to work or not, and you've been in the studio and you've arranged and recorded your own material, after a while you kind of know, you know what you got to do, and um, you just got to spend more time to crack the code on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jason? You you nailed it. That was yeah. I actually absolutely agree. Mm. You know, you know, and you know. It's just like okay. Yeah. It's good. And I also want to say that's really right. Just to, you always got to do the next morning check. You're like, Oh, what was I thinking last night? That's terrible. It's a terrible <laughs> idea. I've been there many nights or many yeah. mornings. I was there this morning, actually. <laughs> so I'm hearing, I'm hearing that you have to be your own worst critic. That's what I'm hearing. Oh yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta be able to see your blind self mm -hmm. because other people see it. And yeah. uh, so you gotta see it too. It hurts a lot more coming from someone else too. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> so we got lots of questions online here too. Cheryl, what else do we got? Um, what rhymes with rhyme zone? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I don't know if that was a serious question. No. Okay. So how often do you collaborate or, or yeah, how often do you collaborate with others if you have that all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as often as I can. Um, and it's usually project related because I'm trying to make a new recording or uh, mm. I'm trying to, you know, finish something. Um, but as a, as a habit, I guess it's not really uh, there on the, you know, uh, it's not, I don't know, you know, some people have like a standing air appointment, like a, every Tuesday they're going to go in and get their, you know, get a blowout or something, you know, <laughs> I think ladies. <laughs> do that i don't have any kind of a standing appointment with a songwriting it's, it's very loosey-goosey what about you jason um now that i'm not really uh how do i say it, relevant it doesn't really matter <laughs> but back in the day yeah it was it was almost every day but when i was in nashville i was in nashville for seven years so that's kind of like the go-to place where everyone wants to collaborate and so it was uh more often than i really wanted to um mm -hmm. But now, funny. Now that I'm a worship director, I uh, my songs. I, I take them. I take my songs to my boss, pastor, because he is. Uh, he's he's very theologically sound, you know. So if I have an idea, like I'll bring a melody and kind of like the first draft, if you will, lyrically, and he'd be like, "Well, he's like this doesn't really uh, theologically really make a lot of sense. You know, you should try something like this." And this, this has only happened once so far, but he put a list on my on in my office just of I, of the draft. He's like, "Hey, maybe look up this this scripture and it had, like just the reference." I'm like, "Oh, that's pretty cool." And so he's he's the last person that I've written a song with, and it was a really really cool idea. So because mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot more writing more for church, I'm just going to him, and he's a very musical guy. He's a killer guitar player and an unbelievable singer too. So he's got like a history of songs, and he's a killer player too so uh and and yeah that's kind of where i've been lately um in the past there were some really really amazing talented people i got to work with and i took a lot out of it from i think from everybody i'd ever written a song with i was just like because you want to write with someone that you feel is a better writer than you you don't want to go mm -hmm. as like oh this is kind of a waste of time and thankfully i feel like i've never felt like i'm the best songwriter and i've always got room to grow so that hasn't been the, a problem to date so has there been anyone that you really would want to co-write with if you had the opportunity? Probably Jacob Moon. Oh, there you go. That's Come on, on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, buddy. Let's make it happen. Ooh, right. Yeah. Why we're here. 
That's why right. not? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So this is well, all about- I'm hoping that this is helping a lot of our viewers because I don't know, Jacob and Jason, if we told you this, but one of our projects at the hub is actually working towards uh, creating a Christmas, uh, I want to say co- collaboration. Um, <laughs> um, help me out, Dale. What's the word I'm looking for? Christmas well, compilation. We, That's the word. It's right? a compilation CD. We're trying to put all of our different um, um, heads together, make make a bunch of Christmas songs, put a CD out, uh, potentially this next Christmas up and coming, um, tour it in um, November and uh, have fun with it and uh, see we're taking these processes of learning to write, um, learning to record, learning to arrange whatever and make an application of actually putting a CD together and uh, it'll be a motivating factor and also the end result will be something that we can all say I learned how to do that and I actually did it. So that, that's there you go. And also your CDs are really uh, the thing that people are buying to consume music these days so I think it's going to go places. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a joke? Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe it's a calling card. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, don't worry, uh, Jacob. We are going to do digital format. Um, oh, good. Good. Yeah, don't leave any stone unturned. It's going to be do the vinyl, <laughs> too, for the hipster. Right. You got to do the beards. You got to do, do the vinyl. My, I'll do a cassette just for you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. I guess I better call it a compilation project. How's that? <laughs> People still call them records. I don't know. Yeah, they're they're a record of what you did. That's well true. Yeah. We think of record as that plastic vinyl thing. Yeah. Oh well. Okay, so that's great. Any other questions? We've got fourteen people talking online. This is awesome. Okay, so I'm seeing. Uh, uh, do you allow people to change your mind? Oh. Does that mean people like influence them to change their mind about certain things? Yes, and when we're songwriting. songwriting. Yeah. Yes. Hey guys, yeah. you do, right? Eh? Yeah. Yes. yes. Usually, my wife's uh, the most honest person. So she, you know, especially now that I'm older, like I'm, I'm going to be forty in a few years. That's so weird to me. <laughs> I still write like I'm seventeen years old. Like I, I don't know. So here she's like. So this is too like pop punk she's like you've got way too many words in that little bar I'm like yeah you're right so you know i'm, I'm okay to to hear criticism and if it makes me a better writer then i'm all ears awesome absolutely yeah no it's it's good it's good to get as many viewpoints as possible as you can on the song ultimately the final arbiter is the audience and whether they think they your song is worthwhile and so uh yeah it's um um, but yeah, you, you have friends that you kind of play it for if you're a little insecure about it. But as I said before, usually we know whether it's going to, it's going to make sense or not. And, uh, we throw lots of macaroni at the wall and some of it sticks and, you know, the stuff that sticks sometimes really surprises us too. Yeah. By the way. Awesome. Well, you know what? We want to encourage mentorship. So I'll just ask this general question. If we had any other uh, advice that we needed and we couldn't cover it on this particular um, meeting but we could contact you after the fact would you be open to answering other questions from our audiences yeah yeah absolutely uh, not what's that <laughs> Jason's I didn't hear you. Know, I'm a yes Jess I jest. you said Jess okay <laughs> Uh, that would be absolutely awesome. Um, so I want to say thank you both, uh, Jason and Jacob. Uh, Dale, did you have any other thing you want to say or you're good? Dale? I've lost Dale. I wanted to thank you, Jason and uh, Jacob, for being online with us and sharing your thoughts about songwriting. I think we've learned quite a lot. Um, Oh, I've still got more questions from people that are, are flowing in here. Um, I'll just ask this one song before I let us go. One question about the cost to record a song. Um, any highlights on cost for recording? Depends what you're recording. Depends you know. on what you're recording? Yeah, it's <laughs> changed so much in the last 10 years. Like People can do it for nothing pretty much nowadays. But you also got to remember, you get what you pay for. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and and yet, Billie Eilish's uh, Grammy-winning record was made in a 
bedroom basically with her and her brother and just kind of on a, a cheap uh, you know garage band or whatever so it's uh, it's possible to make uh, pretty pretty chart topping music you know with very uh, primitive now widely available digital tools you know um, so uh, it can cost nothing and you should probably start there you know and see what you can do with that you know it's there's been a lot of people who've learned and cut their teeth just taking a song that they really like and trying to re-record it, you know, faithfully uh, with the, all the same sounds, same everything, and learn how to track and record um, sounds so that they're uh, compelling and that they, they sound right and, um, and they sell the song. Yep, awesome. And, um, so, I think that's great as you know, nice. Doing that uh, in your own, you know, yeah, if you're an engineer, then that's your thing, then that's great. So a lot of artists are not, and they don't understand the signal chain and how to have things not sound distorted and, and how to or mix things so that they sound good or loud enough or whatever it is. And I think you still need to go to experts for that stuff. But there's so many digital tools out there now that will help you, uh, you know, with the yeah. press of a button practically sure. to get a great mastering job when you're on your recording. You can get internet mastering for dirt cheap now. Don't have to pay like the big bucks the way we used to yeah, you know true. it's so there's, there's so many ways that you can get the cost down don't don't accept it when somebody just says it's going to cost you two or three grand a song yeah uh, that that was the story at one time but i don't think that's the story anymore yeah no, that's, that's good to know <laughs> bill we lost your audio yeah i think it you hear me now I can hear you now. I, I, I had a little problem with my dog, and uh, so <laughs> I pulled my earphone right out of the cord, and now it's not working. So oh. anyway, yeah, we, uh, we've we been on for an hour now, so um, that's been, uh, um, I don't know if you want to go a little longer, but I just want to thank everybody who is listening right now, you, you're, you're troopers. I appreciate the fact that you're here. I hope you've learned um, something, and there's something that you can take away from this. Now, I don't know if there's any other question you have, Cheryl, that you want to ask. Um, not at the moment. I, I think that we have a lot of information that we need to digest here. <laughs> we sure do. We sure do. And Jason, thank you. Jacob, you're awesome. I appreciate your time this evening. Yes. You're such a blessing to us. And uh, may God keep you. And in this uh, time this, uh, that we're living in, we just pray good health on you guys and your families. Thank you so thank much. You guys. All the best. All the best. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you everyone who tuned in.